my tools. This is my toolbox. I just got to figure out how to open it. If you got your Bibles, turn with me to Luke chapter 12. I'm kind to going to um, put all these scriptures and all these sermons that we've had together over the last month or two together in like one and because Brock had the gospel according to chocolate milk the title of my me message today is how do you know a crayon goes in the box how do you know a crayon goes in the box this is going to be good it's not going to be as good as the gospel of chocolate milk, but it's going to be good. I mean, we hear things all the time, and I get messages and texts and stuff just of encouragement of what the Lord's been speaking to our church over the last weeks. But I also hear, man, that was that was, you know, that was that was deep. I've got to go listen to that again. I gotta, I gotta, you know, there's so much in that. I, I need to I need to hear it again, and and I hope you're doing that. Uh, and so I'm staying here because I don't want to move here until we get it, until we all get it. You know, if we don't take people with us, we're not doing anything but taking a walk, right? And so you want to get it. So I'm going to I'm going to rehash some things, but I'm going to bring it in a new way, and I'm going to try to simplify it. Have have uh, have you heard? Have you heard it said that the Bible contradicts itself? Have you heard that? Anybody ever heard that? Yeah, we hear it all the time. Well, the Bible contradicts itself. Well, today we're going to examine a, a, an incredibly powerful contradiction, it seems, and then just explore the whole idea of why it's really not a contradiction. Okay? All right? So we're going to start with uh, Luke chapter 12. Verse 49. Verse 49. I came to send fire on the earth, and how I wish it were already kindled. But I have a baptism to be baptized with, and how distressed I am Till it is accomplished. This is Jesus speaking. If you've got a word for word translation, this is probably in red. Do you suppose that I came to give peace on earth? Question mark. What's the answer? I tell you, not at all, but rather division. For from me, from, from now on, five in one house will be divided, three against two, and two against three. The father will be divided against the son, and the son against the father. The mother against the daughter, and the daughter against the mother. The mother-in-law against her daughter-in-law, and the daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. So we can see from this passage of Scripture as we begin to go over it that what Jesus says here is that I came to bring division. I didn't come to bring peace. Would we all agree about that? So let's look at a few things about this. Jesus says, I came to send fire on the earth. If it was me and I was you, I would either underline or circle, I came to. Anytime you see Jesus say, I came to, you might want to take pay attention of why Jesus came. And he says, I came to send fire on the earth on the earth which is a beautiful statement and I'm going to put all this together so you're going to have to hang with me in each one of these points to get to the last point okay because I'm just going to do one point at a time and I'm not going to give a full explanation I'm just going to talk about that particular point so he comes to send fire on the earth and how I wish it were already kindled now this is prior to the outpouring of the Holy Spirit on the earth. And when we see 
John the Baptist in Matthew chapter 3, I believe it is, he looks at Jesus and says, you know, this is the guy that whose straps, whose sandals I'm not worthy to wear. He's saying about him, I'm not even worthy to be his servant. He, I baptize you with water, but he's going to baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. Now, Jesus is making reference to this future thing about baptizing with fire, that there's this fire. I came to bring fire to the earth, and I came to bring this baptism to the earth. If it were me and I were a Christian, I would find out a little bit about what this fire meant and what this baptism is. I'm going to talk a little bit about it, but I certainly don't have time to deal with it all today. But I want to tell you, when I first came to the Lord and when I got engulfed by the Holy Spirit, I wanted to figure out what just happened to me and what it meant. And as a believer, this is an incredibly important thing when Jesus says, I came to send fire. I wish it was already kindled now, but I have a baptism to be baptized with and how distressed I am till it actually is accomplished. How distressed I am. This word distressed actually means I'm hemmed up. I'm, I'm pinned in. I can't, you know, it's kind of like uh, when uh, some of the armies of the enemy were around Jerusalem and had them trapped. Jesus says, I'm kind of trapped right now. I'm hemmed in until I baptize, until I send the Holy Spirit. So I want to do it right now, but, but I'm kind of trapped in this timeline that I have to deal with. And I am, uh, I am pinned in until it is accomplished. I think that's a that's pretty awesome thought. How many of you have ever really realized that God's time frame sometimes is a little inconvenient it makes you feel trapped and hemmed in to your circumstance but you can be you can rest assured that his timing is perfect and his grace is sufficient for whatever you've got to accomplish whatever life brings you so do you suppose that I came to give peace on earth and of course we would say yes because we know that the angels said yes so why is Jesus saying that he didn't come to bring priests and who is he talking to he says I tell you the truth I came to bring division and then he describes the family situation what goes into a family what's he talking about it's really simple and it really needs to be a paradigm shift in our thinking about those who don't believe how many of you are thinking that Jesus and the Father are sitting up there going, <clears throat> boy, I sure hope they believe. I, I really hope that they believe. Your friend, your family member, your neighbor, you know, your co-worker, do you think God is stressed out about them believing? Do you think he doesn't know whether they're going to believe or not? Do you think we need to be stressed out of whether they're going to believe or not? No. He already knows who's going to come. He already knows who's going to say yes. He already knows who's going to believe. Well, that sounds like predestination. It kind of does, doesn't it? It kind of does. If you know what predestination is for you theologians, there's kind of a mix in there, isn't it? Well, some people call it the sovereignty of God. And some people call it predestination. But the, here's, the, here's the point. God's not surprised who gets in. The point is, is it predestination or is it, or is it sovereignty? I don't care. God knows who's going to get in. And what he did... When he says, I came to bring division, he came to separate out those who would believe and who would not believe. I came to draw a line. So if he came to bring division, do you think the world ought to know that there's a difference 
between someone who believes and someone who does not believe. There should be a difference. There, if there's a division, there are some that are going to be on one side of that division and some on the other to such a degree that there's persecution because you believe. Right? You, and, and, it, and it happens in families. How many have experienced persecution in your families? Immediate families. You don't have to raise your hand, I don't guess. Or you, you chickens don't, but everybody else can. How many of you have had a family member say to you, that's just, that's just too radical? That's just too radical. Well, let me just tell you, if somebody doesn't tell me I'm radical, I'm going to question how well I'm following Christ. Because there needs to be a division on what people see me as and what they see everybody else. Right? Right? So, God says, Jesus says, I came to bring division. So that's number one. Number two, turn with me to John chapter 17. Now, we've been in John a little bit <clears throat> lately, especially this particular passage, John 17. Verse 20. Jesus prays. For unity. Wait a minute. I came for division, and I'm going to pray for unity. That's interesting, isn't it? I came to divide. I came to separate those who are going to believe and those who aren't going to believe. And I, I came to make a, a great chasm in between the two because we're called out. But, but what I want you to understand after today's message what Jesus actually was meaning with unity. But <clears throat> we really need to know that Jesus prays first for himself, and then he prays for his disciples, and then he prays for believers. But before I read verse 20, I want to point out that in, in Luke uh, chapter 12, before uh, Jesus uh, brought the word that he came to bring division, that whole that whole setup, what Jesus was really talking about was that when he, when, he, uh, when he comes back or when you meet him, how many of you know he either is going to come back or you're going to go to him, right? I mean, we're, life is short. The older you get, the more you realize how short life is. So we're either going to see the second coming of Jesus or we're going to go to Jesus, right? And he says, when you see me, I want you to be prepared. I want you to be prepared to see me. I want you to be caught doing what is good, doing what is righteous. Get caught doing that. In other words, when you die, die doing, you know, die with your lifestyle and your pursuit being about me, being about the things of me, being about on mission for me. Or when I come back, be caught doing that thing, be caught being focused on that thing. And then he says, I came to bring division. Now, before he talks about unity, He's also uh, talking about that same subject. He begins to pray for himself, and he said there's an hour coming, and it's, and it's upon us, and, 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 and you need to be prepared. You need to be found worthy of the call. Love that thought that you've got to be found worthy of the call. What's the call? The division. The called out ones, the ones that are divided and separated out to Christ, right? So that's what Jesus is talking about, and then he prays for himself, and then he prays for the apostles, and then he prays for you and me in John chapter 17, verse 20. And he says, I do not pray for those alone, these apostles, these disciples that are following him, but also for those who will believe in me through their word that they all, if you have your Bible, circle they all, that they all may be one. Now, I've got maybe one underlined. And we're talking here about unity, right? That they all may be one. 
that they all may be unified. Who is that? That's the church. That's not only the church at Eastside. That's every church that names the name of Jesus. Well, how do you get that? I mean, the whole reason we've got denominations is because we can't agree. Right? So what is he talking about? Well, he's not talking about denominations. Because denominations really just have different opinions on doctrine. Doctrine is what you do as a believer. In other words, predestination or the sovereignty of God. That would be a doctrine. You would stand on one side of that doctrine or another, and some of us are a mix. Some of us are a mutt. You know, you kind of think it could be a little bit of both. You know, some... There are different doctrines. Some say once you're saved, you're always saved. But I think you ought to read Second Peter before you come to that conclusion, or maybe Hebrews 6. There's a lot of different scriptures that don't support that theology. But the reason that you have so many different types of Christianity is because of those doctrines, right? So Jesus can't be talking about that, or there's no way he's coming back. Do y'all see us getting rid of all the denominations? Do you see the Catholic Church and the Protestant Church combining? I don't see it. Do you see the Presbyterians combining with the Pentecostals? Do you see? I mean, do we see that coming? I don't, I, I don't know that that it's not, it's not bigger than God. But it probably isn't going to come. So then what is Jesus talking about? He's talking about the whole of the church. He's not just talking about east side, even though he is talking about east side. But he has to be talking about something different than denominations. Now when you look at this box of crayons, you see that there's 120 different denominations of colors in this crayon box. Are they all crayons? They're all crayons, but they look a little different, don't they? They do look a little different. Good. That's the same thing that's going to happen as far as the coming of the Lord. So the Lord can't be, when he's talking about unity here, he can't be talking that we be all one denomination as we know denominations, right? That we be, but, but he still says that I want all of them to be one. And he says he wants us to be one in verse 21 as Jesus and the Father, as the Father is in Jesus and Jesus is in the Father, that they also may be one in us. It's a beautiful picture of the Trinity. Not only that, but we're included in the oneness of Jesus and the Father, right? Do y'all see that? Is it pretty clear in Scripture that that's what's going on? Okay. That the world may believe that you sent me. And so the whole reason of this unity and, 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 and this, this um, expression of who Jesus is, who the Father is, and who we are in them is just an expression of what? That we be one. As they are one, how are they one? When he's talking about oneness, how are they one? They are the same in their nature, in their character, in their attributes. Jesus is the same as the Father. He is a perfect image of the Father. And he's saying that all of us as the church would be the perfect image of him. That's what we're supposed to do. It doesn't matter whether you're Presbyterian. It doesn't matter whether you're Methodist, whether you're Pentecostal, whether you're Catholic. It doesn't matter. There are people in all the denominations who are really part of the church. How many of you know that if the rapture came today, half the people sitting in the services on Sunday morning would stay if you believed in that particular aspect of the rapture in other words how many of you know that everybody sitting in the church isn't really part of the body of Christ you, you're tracking with me what makes you part that you have committed your life 
to believe and trust in the nature and the character and the mission of Jesus. And that you are committing to a life to, be, to emulate him. In the early church, they called it the way. What way? Jesus' way. You, you give up your right to do it your way. It's no longer your way. It's Jesus' way. And Jesus said about the church, when we begin to, the, across denominational lines, begin to emulate the nature and the character and the attributes of God as the church, then the world will know that the Father sent Jesus. And his prayer was, that you be like him. That you be like him. That you be one. That you be unified in this mission. What's the mission? To be like Jesus. To be like Jesus. Well, I can't do that, preacher. Pastor, that's... That's an unaccomplishable task. And so what, what you're saying, if you say you cannot do that, is you're saying that Jesus didn't know what he was talking about when he actually prayed this prayer. What you're saying is that, that Jesus, if he'd, had a, if he'd had a sober judgment, he'd have never prayed this. He'd have thought of something else to ask the Father for. Right? That's what you're saying. You're saying Jesus didn't have a clue. Or that he wasn't a righteous man and he didn't have the ability to prevail because we know Scripture says that a righteous man's prayer availeth much. It, it accomplishes a lot. And so, so we got to get past this mindset that grace is mercy. Grace is not mercy. They're two different words. Grace is God's power to do something in your life that you cannot do on your own. And so he's saying that I can't wait to have this baptism of fire come down on you. I can't wait to outpour the Holy Spirit. I wish it was happening now. I don't know if you remember when you first got saved, man, there was a fire that came over me. When I got filled with the Holy Spirit, what did the fire do? It burned off the junk that didn't look like Jesus. It consumes the things of the flesh in the world. And it is still consuming the things of the flesh in the world. The fire is. And the Holy Spirit leads me to all truth. It, it reveals to me the nature, the character, and the attributes of Jesus. And then the Holy Spirit empowers me to be like Jesus. And so my third point is this, that this unity that I'm talking about is not a man-made unity. It's not man-made. It's not something that you can muster up on your own. It's not produced by self-will. It's produced by the Spirit of God. That's why it's so important that you be baptized in the Holy Spirit because you have no ability to to experience or meet the requirements of a Christian without being filled with the Holy Spirit. And, the, and, and what God is asking us to be is to be like Jesus. And the reason we're not and what brings, um, what brings disunity to the church more than anything else. Listen to me. Listen. This is so important. If what brings unity is believing that Jesus is who he said he is and we can become like him, that's belief. That's faith, right? So if you're going to bring disunity in the church, what you have and what brings disunity is unbelief and a lack of faith. Unbelief and an absence of faith brings disunity in the church. Because it's saying, it's bringing a division of what, God, what Jesus said he came to do, to bring division. If you have unbelief, if you don't believe that about yourself, do you really believe? 
Do you really believe that no matter how bad you messed up or how many poor choices you made or whatever uh, cards you were dealt in this life, good, bad, or indifferent, that God is not big enough to handle your situation when he created everything on earth, when he came in the flesh, when he loved you so much that he sent his own son so that he could take you out of that prison and put you back on top of that cage, on top of my cage. I've been released. I've been set free. I'm sitting up here and I'm looking down at the faithfulness of God to break me free from my captivity. That's what that song is singing about. Do you not believe God? If you don't believe God, that brings disunity in the church because Jesus was praying that we be unified about this one thing, that we be like him. And the only way, can you imagine saying, can you imagine ever accomplishing that when you say in your own mind, I just can't do it. You just don't know my history. You don't know my past. And you know, I just don't know the word. I just don't know the Bible that good. Or I've been feeling sorry for myself for so long, I don't know how to live any way else. Or you name whatever it is that Satan brings to you and, 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 and says, this is your hindrance. God can never do this in you because you fill in the blank. That's unbelief, and that brings division and disunity in the church because God says, He who the Son has set free is free indeed. You're free, and you've got to live as freedom. And that's part of what I want to talk about as far as the title goes. It's produced by the Spirit of God. It's the product of the presence of God. You can't discipline yourself into this state you have to pursue God you've got to know his word if I could get everybody in this place passionate about studying the word of God and when I say that I mean that you love the word of God more than Facebook I mean that you love the word of God more than Pinterest I mean that you love the word of God more than ESPN that you love the word of God more than anything else and you can't live without it. Jesus said man can't live by bread alone but every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Why do you think you can? You've got to get a passion for the word. You've got to know the word of God or the spirit of God has nothing to work with with you. The reason that you're failing is is because you don't have a passion for the word and you've got to have a passion for the word to be transformed into the image of Jesus because Jesus is the word and the word became flesh and dwelt among us are y'all tracking with me you see how all this connects that they may know that the world may believe that you sent me listen to this verse 22 and the glory which the father gave the son and the glory and which the father gave Jesus he says it this way and the glory which you gave me I have given everybody circle given given now he's praying about you I have given them circle that why did he give it to us the glory that we may be one <laughs> just as the Father and the Son are one you've been set up for success you've been set up for victory you can have the glory of God the nature and the character and the attributes of God Jesus says I in them and you in me that they may be made perfect in one how are they made perfect complete lacking nothing the Bible says in unity in unity in one 
in unity, emulating the nature of God, that the world may know that you have sent me. He says it again. And that, ha that you have loved them as you have loved me. Remember I preached on this not long ago? That you need to really come to the conclusion. Everybody listen to this statement. You need to come to the conclusion that the Father loves you as much as he loves Jesus. You are an heir. You're a son. You're a daughter of God. God is good. He says, Father, I desire that they also, I've got also circled, whom you gave me may be with me where I am. So there's going to be th this this work of grace, this baptism of the Holy Spirit, this fire that's going to burn off everything that doesn't look like heaven as we go in this life. We're going to have grace. We're going to have his power working in us. And we have all the power we need for life and godliness. We are partakers of the divine nature. And, and we are to live worthy of the calling of God. There needs to be a distinct division between those who call themselves Christians and those who don't. Now, there's all kind of denominations. I'm going to read you some scripture here in just a minute just to back that up, but I just want you to I'm gonna get this down so you understand it. There's all kind of denominations. I have a, a 120 different colors, and this is a brand new box of crayons. It really haven't, it doesn't have, it's like a newborn baby. It doesn't have any life experiences yet. But when we start using these crayons, and, and some of them are uh, around a kind of rough two-year-old. Some of you have them. They might get broken in half. They might have a particular favorite and use that thing like crazy. And it gets worn out. The paper has to be peeled off. Right? But, but... If you have a two-year-old and 120 crayons are scattered on the ground along with 400 other toys, how do you know that the crayon goes in the crayon box? How do you know? What? It looks like a crayon. You got a pen in front of you. Everybody hold, grab a pen out in front of you. Hold it up to me. If that pen cried out, I'm a Christian. I'm a Christian. Or if that pen cried out, I'm a crayon. I'm a crayon. What would you say? No, you're not. You're a pen. Why? Doesn't look like a crayon, does it? might be burning something off of me right now what about you doesn't look like him there's so many things about our nature and our character but don't look like Christ he says man I got a baptism for that I'm going to burn that mess off fill you with the power of success not in your own will it's not by your own might it's not by your own power it's by my spirit says the Lord Ephesians chapter 4 we 
talked about this not long ago, verse 1 through 6. Listen to this. Paul says, as he writes to the church, I'm a prisoner of the Lord, and I beg you to walk worthy of the calling in which you were called. I beg you. Why? Don't you see that this is the words of Jesus written or given to Paul to write to you and me? I beg you, Jesus is saying to you and me, I beg you, please walk worthy of the calling. Why? Because it's the only way that they're going to know that the Father sent me. And I'm waiting, and I've got a baptism that will bring the church into unity and to this one thing, that they look like me. That they look like me. Jesus says that they look like the Father. Be lowly and gentle, patient. Bearing with one another in love. Keeping the unity of the Spirit. You hear that? What is unity? It's the Spirit of God in all of us that looks like Jesus. Be filled to overflowing with the Spirit. And that's what brings peace. There is one body and one Spirit. Just as you were called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, was above all and through all and in you all. Second Peter, <laughs> chapter 1, verse 2 through 4. So powerful. Read this with me out loud. As his divine power, say it boldly, as his divine power has given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness. If it was me and I was you, I would circle all. You've been, by the power of God, if you are a believer, you've been, giving, you've been given the ability to, to, to represent Jesus in life. With every circumstance. You've been given a divine power. And it has been given to you for one specific purpose. And that is to portray godliness. Through the knowledge of him who called us by glory and virtue. By which have been given to us exceedingly great and precious promises. That through these promises you might be partakers of the divine nature. He's talking to the church that through this power, through this submission to the work of Jesus Christ in you and in me, that we can experience the transformation into the character and the nature of God because we've escaped the, the corruption of the world by making a profession of faith in him. You can say you're a Christian all day long. But really, you have to ask the question. If I'm scattered amongst all the people, is there a division? Would somebody gather me up and put me in a box called Christian because I look like a Christian. I don't just say I'm a Christian, but I look like a little Christ. That's the call of the church. That's the unity that Jesus prayed for in the church so that the world would know I want to be a Christian. You? I stand for closing prayer.
Father, your word is true. Can you, would y'all pray that with me? If you want to, pray that with me. Father, your word is true. Father, your word is true. And I believe. I give you permission with no compartmentalization. You can have all of me. Every thought, everything that comes off my tongue would be a blessing and not a curse. If Jesus wouldn't say it, I don't want to say it. If Jesus wouldn't do it, I don't want to do it. If Jesus doesn't think it, I don't want to think it. Lord, I want to be like you. I want to be unified because of your spirit working in me, renewing my mind, making me like y'all need prayer our prayer team's going to come y'all go ahead and come Michael you got a song Michael has a song y'all want to sing a song with Michael a song of commitment why don't we do that together and uh, if you need prayer if you need healing if you know somebody that needs healing you, you need anything I, I know I know there are people that we love that are sick and I just ask that you come get prayer for them ask the Lord to heal them if you haven't been following the Lord the way you want to, if you would, if you question whether you're a believer or not, I pray that you come down forward and tell one of these people up front that you want to commit your life to Christ. If you've been away, if you have been not living a life that well represents Jesus and you want somebody just to agree with you and pray that the power and the grace of God would arrest you, would baptize you afresh and in you, Come and get prayer as well. Amen. Let's sing this song together. Let me be filled with kindness and compassion for the one. The one in whom you love and gave. Son for humanity, increase my love. So help me to love with open arms like you do. Love that erases all the lies and sees the truth. Oh, that when they look in just a smile they would feel the father's love oh how you love us from the homeless to the famous and in between you formed us you made us carefully cause in the end we're all your children. So help me to love with open arms like you do. A love that erases all the lies and sees the truth. Oh, that when they look in my eyes, they would see you. Even in just a smile. Love. All my life, tell of who you are. The wonder of your never ending love. Let all my life 
you do I love that he raises all the lights and sees the truth oh that when they look in my eyes they would see you even in just a smile they would feel the father's love even in just a smile they would feel the father's love we're going to keep our prayer teams rolling but we need to dismiss i'm going to sing a uh, read a benediction i'm not going to sing it i'm going to save you from that i'm just going to read it that's all right now all glory to god who is able to keep you from falling away and will bring you with great joy into the glorious present without a single fault. All glory to him who alone is God, our Savior through Jesus Christ our Lord. All glory, majesty, power, and authority are his before all time and in the present and beyond all time. Amen? Amen. God bless you. You guys have a great week. We'll see you Wednesday night.